Amen. Well, um, it was probably right about a year ago, um, my good homeboy, Tim Case back there, was showing up to pick me up for a surf trip, which we do whenever the swell's good. We, we like to get over out to Crescent City, and we try and leave early, usually around 4 a.m. So Tim's like, hey, I'm, I'm about to pick you up, 4 a.m., like we're going surfing. And I was like, perfect. I have my board at the door. We're ready to go. It's supposed to be an epic swell, hopefully trying to score some barrels and whatnot. And uh, he texts me, and he says, I'm almost there, right? So I come walking out my door at 4 a.m. with my surfboard and my wetsuit. And as I open my door, I kid you not, from me to my boy Ben Morris right here is a freaking huge mountain lion sitting like right, right there, dude. And I open my door. You don't expect when you open your door at 4 a.m. to like see a mountain lion greeting you, right? But I did. I just walked out and I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh. And he freaked out too because I scared him. And he like jumped over the fence. And dude, this thing should have been in a zoo. It is, it was so huge, dude. It looked like a legit lion. Like its tail was like the size of my body. It was insane. So I freaked out, dude, and I ran back in and I was like tripping out. I was like so scared. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I was like, dude, no one's gonna believe me. I have to like get it on video. So I did what all millennials do, which is like, you gotta film that. You gotta have evidence, right? So I like cracked back open my door and I was like super freaking out. I was like, this probably isn't a good idea, but I gotta get a video. So I walked back out and sure enough, like he was in the street, like, and I just lived like two blocks of like from downtown, like right above Lithia. And he's right there, dude, in the street. And so I creeped out and was like behind a car and like filming him. And he was like looking back at me and like wagging his tail. And I was like, oh my gosh, dude, this is so freaky. And then sure enough, he like ran up into my neighbor's heart, uh, uh, up, to, up my neighbor's fence, climbed over and like disappeared. And I was like, whoa, dude, like I was tripping out. And, and Tim showed up and he's like, you ready to go, dude? And I was like, dude, there was just a mountain lion right here. And he's like, what? And I was like, yeah, dude, he was crazy. And it was like, oh my gosh, I showed him the picture. I ended up posting on Facebook and then like all these news stations hit me up and we're like, can we play this on the news? And it made it onto like all the local news stations. They're like, a uh, surfer from Ashland walked out and there was a mountain lion. <laughs> That's a cool story, right? And it was, it was pretty funny. But um, from that day forward for, for at least a couple of weeks and, and still sometimes it even happens when I'm, when I'm going outside my front door at night or in the morning when it's dark, like I got this hardcore like kind of PTSD like anxiety of like, oh shoot, like is, there's a mountain lion that lives by my house. And not only that, but pretty much every single week, like probably once a week, a giant black bear comes up my driveway and eats my garbage and super annoying. I was paying for like the, the bear can and paying five bucks a month. I was like, I'm not doing that. So I got the normal can and now he's coming all the time. So I gotta go back to the bear can, but there's bears, there's mountain lions. And so like, I got this hardcore like anxiety of being outside in the dark because of the fact that like there's crazy wild animals like in my yard, which is super Super weird. And so uh, I'm here today and we're in a series right now talking about the importance of emotions and emotional health. And for the past couple months, we've been specifically focusing on one emotion every single week. And today we are going to talk about a very controversial emotion, and that would be anxiety. And uh, the Bible actually has a lot to say about anxiety. And it probably is a lot of stuff that most people maybe have never actually heard about anxiety as far as in the church. And if you grew up in the church, most of the things you've probably heard around anxiety would be statements such as this, anxiety is bad, anxiety is sinful. If you struggle with anxiety, you just need to pray more. You don't need counseling, you just need more of God. If you trust God more, if you pray more, all of your anxiety will go away. If you are struggling with anxiety, it's probably a sign that you have little faith and you're not trusting God. All sorts of statements like this. And I've kind of thought about that and um, was like, well, what about the mountain lion thing, right? Like. Is that like sinful that like I'm kind of freaked out when I go outside? Like, is that wrong that I feel that? Is, am I not trusting God that he's gonna protect me from a mountain lion, right? Now, all, all these statements that if you grew up in the church that you've probably heard are extremely reductionistic and they fail to consider a couple of things. Number one, the complexity of being a human. I think one of the main things that the church has not done a great job at is talking about the theology of anthropology. That is what makes us human and it's a lot more complex than we think. You can't boil it down to these simple statements. But also, I think that we have failed to consider the different contexts in which the Bible talks about the word anxiety. Because the Bible talks about anxiety in both positive and negative contexts. And so it's not all bad and evil like most of us have assumed. Most people who make these statements that all anxiety is wrong and you're not trusting God and you don't have enough faith and you just need to pray more, most people who think that way have actually never studied 
studied what the Bible has to say about anxiety. They've just heard these statements growing up in the church, and so they kind of adapt them and believe them and then repeat those to other people. So I first off, before we get into all this, just wanna say, if you're kind of in this boat and grew up with this type of mindset that all anxiety is wrong, sinful, you just need to trust God, you need to pray more, if that's what you have been taught and, and grown up being taught, I just wanna say, if we could look at the scriptures together and just say, kind of, if, if you would, come with me on the journey and maybe let your guard down and maybe challenge some of the presuppositions and some of the things that you have been taught and have believed and allow yourself to be retaught from what the scripture says today about anxiety. Because the reality is, again, most of these things um, are not rooted specifically in what the scripture says. And the scripture, again, only speaks into a few particular aspects of anxiety, which we're gonna get into and talk to this morning. So depending on the context, um, anxiety comes from or may be one of five different types. So if you are taking notes this morning, it would be probably helpful uh, to write down these five different types of anxiety or things that produce anxiety in us, two of which are what we see in the scripture. So we're gonna talk about that. The first one, again, five types of anxieties, five things that may produce anxiety in us. Number one, anxiety could be a temporary normal emotional response to certain situations. So again, we're talking about five things that cause anxiety or five types of anxiety. A temporary normal emotional response to certain situations. Every single human being, part of being human is that you will experience anxiety based off different factors and experiences in your life. It could be a reaction to uncertainty or impending danger or stressors or you walk out your front door and there's a cougar there. God designed us as humans to when something like that happens, we're flooded with anxiety and it's actually for your benefit. That's a normal emotion you should feel so that your fight or flight kicks in and you're able to escape to a safe place. So every single human at different seasons of life will experience what is just a normal amount of human anxiety that is temporary, uh, that's just a temporary anxiety. Here's a couple examples, right? Like maybe the cougar one. Maybe for me, it's the bear. Let's say you're a Niners fan, right? Which I am. When the Super Bowl happens next week, guaranteed, no matter how much I pray about it, I'm gonna have a normal human anxiety. I'm gonna be like, I really want them to win. When I was at the game three weeks ago, there's nothing you can do, right? Like if you love sports or your sports team, when your team's playing, or maybe you play sports, you're on the field, you have on game day, like just this, this anxiety, you're anxious. And it's not like, oh, you're not trusting God. Oh, you're sinning. That's just normal human anxiety based off your life circumstances. If you don't study for an exam that you have, you show up to school the next day, guess what? You're gonna have anxiety because you didn't study for it. That is a normal byproduct of the fact that you chose not to study. For those of y'all who are married, you probably remember the final couple weeks or days or the day of your wedding. You have all this anxiety around it. You don't know what to expect. And is it, oh, you're, you're sinning. You're not trusting God because you feel anxious to get married. No, that, that's a normal human temporary emotion based off of your life circumstances. So there's a difference between normal human anxiety, which is temporary based off our circumstances, and excessive anxiety that stems from not trusting God, which is primarily what the context of the New Testament talks about. When the, when this, and we're gonna get into this more in depth, but this is just a little preview. When the New Testament says, don't be anxious, it is not talking about a temporary anxiety that is short-term based off circumstances. It is stemming from not trusting God, and it becomes a problem when it paralyzes us, when it becomes long-term. If, 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 for example, if, if I chose now to never go out of my house because I saw a mountain lion or saw a bear, that, that would not be helpful. That would not be good. That would probably show that my mind and my heart is in a continual state of anxiety beyond the normal experience. So there is nothing wrong or sinful with a normal human anxiety that is temporary, a temporary emotional response as a result to certain day-to-day -day and life-to-life -life situations. That's the first type. The second type, which is a little bit more complex, would be this, a second type of anxiety, a physiological or psychological or neurological disorder. So there are certain people who 
have some sort of physical or biological or neurological disorder that causes them what would be called like a, a medical diagnostic of anxiety. In fact, anxiety disorders are the most common form of mental illness. And in America alone, 18% uh, of adults are affected by some form of a, a, a medical mental illness that leads to anxiety. And there's many different types of medical uh, anxiety disorders. The, and, and this is not by any means extensive, but it, it could come off as a, a panic disorder. Maybe you have panic disorder. It could be a phobia, an excessive fear of an object or a situation. It could be social anxiety. Some people have social anxiety because of the way they were raised. They are freaked out being in crowds and being around a lot of people. It could be separation anxiety. There's so many different types of medical anxieties and there's many different contributing factors for all these various anxiety disorders. The Cleveland Medical Clinic says this. They said that an overactive or underactive thyroid gland are among the most common medical factors contributing to anxiety. So you could have hardcore anxiety based off of the fact that your thyroid is overproducing or underproducing. It has nothing to do with you failing to trust God or not trusting God. It's, it's, it's a physical, biological thing that's wrong with your body. The female hormone estrogen as well can trigger anxiety when the menstrual cycle fluctuates or during menopause. So a, a woman, when her hormones are out of balance, can have a bunch of anxiety. And that has nothing to do with she's not trusting God enough, she's not praying enough. It, it is your body that is causing that anxiety in, in you. Even sleep deprivation can cause or increase severe anxiety if it is extended for long periods of term. God created us in such a way that rest and, uh, and, and sleep is one of the essential things we need as humans to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually healthy. And there's so many different factors as well, not just these. It could be early childhood negative condition, conditioning. Maybe you grew up in a type of home or a type of environment where you, you were taught to, to fear everything and fear all the world, and you were in a really oppressive environment. And so now you, you have anxiety. You think everything's wrong. You think everything's evil. And, and you just live with that because that's the way that you were raised. It could be trauma. Maybe you experienced a, a very severe or hardcore traumatic event in your life, and now you, you kind of have a PTSD. You kind of have a hardcore anxiety based off of a very intensive situation that you were a part of or that you witnessed. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe in your childhood, you were regularly abused. Maybe in this season of your life recently, you've been regularly abused, and so now being around those individuals causes a certain type of anxiety to arise in you, and that, again, could be for your protection. That, that could be a good thing that God is giving you that to keep you away from those people to set some boundaries. It could be another medical condition. Again, there are so many various factors contributing to anxiety disorders. It's not a one size fits all. And so what we need to know specifically as Christians and followers of Jesus is that not all anxiety is a spiritual problem that is worry-based. And here's what the church has taught for as long as we know, that that they think all anxiety comes from a spiritual problem. The root is spiritual. The root is that you're not trusting God. The root is that you're not praying enough. And most of us, when we know someone or see someone struggling with anxiety, are so quick to play that spiritual card and say, hey, well, what's the deal? You know, is, is there sin in your life? Are you not trusting God? How much are you praying about it? And we forget, again, the complexity of being human. When God created us in Genesis chapter one, God created us both as physical and spiritual beings. We, we, we have a physical aspect to our humanity and we have a spiritual aspect to our humanity, which means there should be both physical and spiritual ways to treat the various circumstances that we are dealing with. And again, I think a lot of Christians forget this. When we look at the complexity of being human, we think that everything is just spiritual, but the reality is there are a lot of things in our life, being a human, that it is a physical problem, not a spiritual problem. And so the solution to that physical problem isn't over-spiritualize it. It is, you might need some physical help. In the same way, you wouldn't tell someone who is going through a battle of cancer or diabetes or who has heart problems, you wouldn't say to them, oh, just trust God more. Just pray about that more, right? We, we've arrived there. We get that. We understand that. Why? Because it's a physical problem. Now, if you have those things, yes, you, you should pray. 
Yes, you should talk to God about, that's really good, but that is a physical problem and there could be a physical solution that can come to your aid to help that. So why, why is it that we don't do this with anxiety? It may be that we haven't understood that there are physical, biological, and physiological factors at play that maybe we haven't thought through. And so we say, hey, it's just a spiritual problem because the Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. And so you have anxiety. And so therefore there's a problem. You're not trusting God enough. Again, I think we've undersimplified and failed to understand what it is to be human, that there are physical and spiritual aspects to it. Now, we're gonna get into this in just a second, but just again, a little precursor. The biblical teachings on anxiety are only focused on the spiritual aspect of being human. This is important for you to know. Again, most people haven't studied what the Bible has to say about anxiety. They've just been taught it, but the Bible does never, never focuses on, never talks about anything to do with physical aspects of anxiety. It always focuses on the spiritual aspect. It doesn't broaden the discussion, which means if your anxiety is rooted in a physical aspect, if it maybe comes from some sort of trauma you experienced or a medical condition or abuse that you faced when you were a kid, if your anxiety is rooted in that, it simply means this. We can't apply what the Bible says about anxiety to your situation. It's not that your situation is irrelevant or unimportant. It simply means that the context of the Bible, when the authors, Paul and Jesus, were talking about anxiety, the specific context that they were talking about is spiritual aspects. And so we don't apply that to the physical things that we are wrestling with. When you take the Bible out of its context, when you take a certain text out of the specific thing it was speaking into, that's what we call a con. You take the text out of context, you just have a con. It's not good. And this is what people do. They don't understand that the Bible was written for a specific purpose to a specific audience in a specific context. And you could pull any verse out of context and make it say anything that you want. But if you don't understand the specific context it was written in, then you're gonna misapply it. And that is very damaging. And that actually hurts people. So if this is something right now that right now you're, you're currently struggling with, you have some sort of mental illness, some sort of anxiety disorder that may be a medical problem, that, that may be uh, an abuse problem, that may be a, a problem in your past that you haven't dealt with, you need to know that this is something, again, that what the Bible says about anxiety and it's not speaking into specifically that. And so if it is a physical problem, if it's rooted in that, there's some physical things that maybe you should do. Maybe you should see a professional counselor. Maybe you should see a therapist. Maybe you should consult medical professionals. Maybe you should get on some medication. There are certain things that God has given us, humans who he's gifted and created in his image who can bring about healing. Now, God could if he wanted, and, and sometimes he does, Again, sh should you pray about it if it is a physical condition? Yes. Can God bring healing to it completely if it is a physical condition? Yes. But most of the time, the healing that you will experience if it is a physical problem will have a physical solution. God brings about healing at times directly. He can do that if he wants. But most of the time, he brings about healing and answer to prayer indirectly through other people who he has gifted for this very purpose. People who have a calling on their life to help people with mental illness. People who have a calling on their life to research these things and study what type of medications can help bring a balance to this person who has imbalanced hormones? What type of thing can we do physically that will help the physical brokenness in this person's body? So again, Jesus doesn't have to answer our prayers directly through himself coming and doing something miraculous. He can bring about healing in a, in a way that is indirect through other people who he has gifted and who he has empowered in the same way that hopefully happens when you come to church on Sunday. Hopefully you, you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And part of that is what happens here. The, the gifting and the calling he's placed on my life to teach the word. Hopefully Jesus speaks to you through that. It is indirectly through me, directly through his scripture, which is so amazing that he uses human beings in the process. So again, number one, anxiety could be a normal temporary thing that is uh, based off of certain circumstances. It could be a physical or a physiological or a neurological thing that again, um, we need to seek physical help for those things. Number three, again, a third type of anxiety. Anxiety could be, third category, a natural consequence of sin. 
Number three, it could be a natural consequence of sin. Here's a few examples. Let's say you're married. Let's say you're cheating on your spouse. I guarantee if that's what you're doing, you will feel anxiety. You're always gonna be worried. You're always gonna be anxious. Is he gonna find out? Is she gonna find out? That is a natural consequence of your poor decisions to cheat on your spouse. And until you make it right and until you confess it, you're gonna continue to wrestle with that anxiety. Maybe you have an unhealthy addiction to gambling. And so as a result, you are constantly struggling with and wrestling with, am I gonna be able to pay the bills? Am I gonna get enough money to be able to cover all these things? Because again, it's a natural consequence of maybe an unhealthy addiction in your life. Maybe you use or you take recreational drugs and those again can have an impairment. They can have an increase on the anxiety that you experience and that you feel. Maybe you've committed a crime. You've done something illegal and you got away with it and yet you're still kind of paranoid. You're still living with this reality of like, oh my gosh, what if I do get caught? What if they do find out? What if the cops do show up at my door? What if I get pulled over and they identify me as this person? Again, that is a normal type of anxiety that you will feel as a natural consequence of your sin. So in these cases, again, anxiety can come and can be the result of sinful behavior. This is a natural consequence of sin. This is a third type of anxiety. Number four, I now wanna look at specifically one of the two types of anxiety that the scripture does talk about. Number four, this is a fourth type of anxiety, and that would be a lack of trust in God's providential care. Number four, this is important, a lack of trust in God's providential care. This is probably the only type of anxiety that most Christians know of. And this is the type of anxiety that they will blanket everything else with. They'll say that all of your anxiety is this one, a lack of trust in God's providential care, but that is not the case. This is very specific and the context is very specific. And I wanna walk us through the few primary passages we see in the New Testament and the context of them and what they're speaking to. So number one would be the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter six. And let's just, this is a, a, a few verses here, but I wanna just read through it. And I want you to just soak this in because there could be people here who are wrestling with and struggling with this type of anxiety, that you have a lack of trust in God's providential care on your life. And listen to what Jesus himself says, Matthew chapter six, starting in verse 25. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither soar nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of, his, of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Jesus here is speaking about anxiety, and he says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about what you eat. Don't be anxious about what you wear. Don't be anxious about what you drink. Don't be anxious about the, fewer, uh, about the future. The anxiety that Jesus is specifically speaking into is not trusting God, again, for our basic provision. 
not trusting God with food, with clothing, with monetary stuff, how the future's gonna work out, stressing about the future. This is a type of anxiety that the Bible specifically seeks to, and Jesus says, that is not good, and that is not healthy, because God is our heavenly Father, and God is gonna provide all those things for us. And he gives examples. Look at the birds of the air. If God takes care of the birds, he's gonna take care of you. Look at the grass of the field. If God takes care of the grass, the field and close them, he's going to clothe you. Over and over, the illustrations that Jesus used is specifically, again, referring to how God provides for us. And if we as humans live in a continual state of anxiety, worrying about the future, worrying about providence, worrying about what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, what the future is going to hold, what we're, where we're going to move, what our career is going to be like, all of those things are the things that Jesus speaks to and says, if you don't deal with that in a healthy way, if you don't bring that to me, we're going to talk about how to deal with that type of anxiety, if you don't do that, that will have a very negative effect on your emotional and spiritual health. To live in that type of anxiety where you're constantly worried about the future, where you're constantly worried about where your next paycheck's gonna come from, where your next meal's gonna come from, what clothes you're gonna wear, all those things. Jesus says, you don't have to do that. He says, that is not a type of anxiety that I want you to have because it re- that, that is an anxiety that we lack faith, that we lack trust, not believing that God is actually gonna take care of us and that God is gonna provide for us. And if any person could have had this type of anxiety, it would have been Paul the Apostle. I want you to hear what Paul the Apostle writes of himself in Philippians chapter four, verse 11 through 13. Listen to what Paul says. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There were times in Paul's life, if you read through the, the, the stories in the book of Acts and the accounts of Paul's life. There's times in Paul's life where he is in abundance, he had a lot, and he is in need, he had nothing. There were times in Paul's life where he didn't know when, where his next meal was gonna come from. There were times in Paul's life where he didn't have financial provision and he didn't know what, how it was gonna work out. And yet Paul says in those moments, rather than choosing anxiety, choosing to worry about it, where am I gonna be next? Where am I called in the mission field? What am I gonna eat? How is this financial provision gonna come through? Paul says, rather than letting anxiety take over in those moments, he said, I've learned to be content. And then he says, again, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, again, this is important. This is just an example for you guys to understand the importance of context. Some people will say this verse and say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Does that really mean you can do anything through God who strengthens you? Some Christians might say, yeah, all things. It means all things. I can do everything. And I would say, okay, jump off this building and fly through him who strengthens you, right? Do you really believe you can do that? Again, context. What does I can do all things through him who strengthens me mean? What it means is exactly in the context what he's talking about. I can abound and I can have nothing. I can have plenty or I could face hunger, but I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So all things doesn't mean you can literally do anything. It means you can learn to be content in all seasons of life. Whether you are in need or whether you have plentiful, God will sustain you. God will take care of you. That's what I can do all things through him who strengthens me means. It doesn't mean you can literally do anything you want. We have to keep it in the context here. And so again, in Paul's life, there were seasons where he didn't know what the future held. But again, rather than choosing to embrace anxiety and say, oh God, you're not gonna come through. He said, you know what? I'm gonna trust. I know God that you're a father. I know that you're gonna provide for me. I know that you're gonna take care of me. And over and over again, the picture painted by scripture when talking about anxiety in a negative context is simply this, that God is our loving father and that God wants to bear that burden for us. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. He says, don't be anxious. What's the context? He says, your father knows you need these things. Your father's gonna take care of you. Every time the Bible talks about anxiety in a negative context, the context is always 
Come and trust the father with that. He's a loving father. He wants to bear that anxiety. He wants to take that from you. He doesn't want you to live in a continual state of that type of anxiety. Paul said this in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. This is probably the most other famous passage in the New Testament about anxiety. He says again, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Again, the context here is important. We would just miss, we would misapply and say, don't be anxious about anything. All anxiety is you're not trusting God. That's not it. He's specifically referring to lack of trust in God, in God's provision. It's the spiritual aspect. And what does he say? Again, the context, he says, let your request be made known to God. If you have this type of anxiety, if you're struggling with a relational trust in the Father and in his provision, he says, you can come and let that request be made known to God. You can tell that anxiety to God. Why? Because he says, he will take that and he'll replace it with a peace that surpasses all understanding, which will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he says, casting all your anxieties on him, the Father, because he cares for you. So this is so important for us to understand that the negative context of don't be anxious, don't have anxiety, is always in the context of relationship with the Father. And the context in the heart is never condemning, never bringing shame. Oh, you don't trust God? You, don't, you, you have that type of anxiety? Well, you're just damned then, like you're just a horrible person. That's never the context. The context is never, you look how horrible you are, you should feel shame and guilt. The context is always invitational. It's an invitation to bring our lack of faith or lack of trust in God to him in our relationship so that he can bear that burden and so that he can replace it with peace. Isn't that beautiful? So again, when the scripture says over and over in every context, don't have anxiety, don't be anxious, it's in the context of a relationship with the Father and his heart and what he wants for you and for me is to bring that to him because he doesn't want you to carry that. He doesn't want you to live in a continual state of, of distrust and worrying about where your provision's gonna come from and worrying what the future holds because God the Father has a plan for your future. He's, writ he's written it down before the beginning of time. He already knows it so you can come and you can trust him. And if God takes care of the birds of the air and if God closes the grass of the field, man, how much more is he gonna take care of and provide for us? That is the context of uh, the negative connotations of anxiety in the New Testament. So it could be, again, a lack of trust in God's providential care. Maybe there's some people here who are wrestling with this type of anxiety. This is the spiritual aspect. And maybe the God brought you here today because he wants you to know all those things that you've been stressed about, all those things that you've been worried about, he's gonna take care of you. He's going to provide for you. And you, you, you may not see how it's all going to work out. And guess what? That's where it comes to trust. That's why it's a relationship. He, he says, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, trust him, give it to him, and he will make your path straight. So number four, again, there is an aspect of anxiety that comes as a lack of trust in God, but that's only one of four. And I want you to see the fifth one. This is so important and so huge, um, if you have your Bibles, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The fifth type of anxiety or a root of anxiety is actually what we see in scripture, a positive, healthy concern for others that is rooted in love. So the Bible does speak about anxiety in negative context. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about your life. But again, it's always context of relationship. Bring it to the Father. He wants to bear that burden. But again, the scripture always ta uh, also talks about anxiety in a positive way. And again, number five is a positive, healthy concern for others that is rooted in love. This is the fifth type of anxiety that you may experience as a human. Now again, most of the teaching around anxiety growing up in Christian circles, always paints it in a negative way. And there is portions of scripture that we just went over that says, yes, you should not have this type of anxiety. You should bring that to God. He cares for you. He wants to bear that burden. But scripture also shares with us positive examples of anxiety. And in the positive sense, it is referring to a, a, a deep concern and a deep care for other individuals. This is a type of anxiety that Paul had. The same guy who said, don't be anxious about anything. 
anything is gonna tell us that he has a type of anxiety that is positive, that is good, that is healthy, that reveals his love and his genuine care and concern for other people. I want you to see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're gonna start in verse 24. Now here, uh, Paul is giving an account of all the trials and tribulations and difficult things that he has went through in his life. He's essentially sharing his story with us. And here's what he says, starting in verse 24. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Wow, crazy. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, not smoking bud. He actually had rocks thrown at him, just so y'all know. We gotta get down to the context here, right? Paul wasn't about that life. I'm just saying, that's for another time though. We'll get into that, don't worry about it. But Paul got stoned with rocks. Three times, he says, I was shipwrecked. A night and a day, I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and verse 28, the climax, and apart from other things, there is daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So Paul here, the same person who wrote, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, give it to God, and the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds. The same guy who wrote, don't be anxious about anything, says here, I have in my life a pressure on me, a continual anxiety for all of the churches. It actually speaks extraordinarily well of Paul that his greatest suffering, the capstone at the end of a long list of all these trials that he went through in ministry is his anxiety for the flourishing and the health of the local churches that he planted. All of these other things, wow, we, we think this is amazing that he went through this, that he was beaten uh, for, for Christ, that he was shipwrecked, that he had no food. We, we go, these are all magnificent. And the climax of his suffering, the climax of his spiritual resume, if you would, is that he still continues to bear this heavy anxiety for, he says, all of the churches. Now, if we're completely honest, few of us can honestly say, our deepest anxiety is rooted in concern for other people and the growth and the health and the flourishing of the church, right? Like that's, that's actually pretty convicting for me that this is like Paul's main anxiety is that he cares so much about the church. Most of us, it's usually not this, but this is a positive anxiety that we see in the scripture. Paul had a healthy, caring concern for the body of Christ, for the churches that he had planted. Again, this isn't a bad thing that he has. This is showing his concern, showing his love, showing that he wants the churches to grow and to flourish and to thrive. And in almost every single one of Paul's letters to the churches he planted, we catch glimpses of, of the anxiety and of the pressure and the fear that he felt for these churches and the desire that he had for them to grow. And again, the, the, the anxiety and pressure that comes around that. Flip over, uh, just, we'll go back a few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse two and three. Here's what Paul says here. He says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul said to the church of Corinth, man, my, my goal, my heart, my aim is to pre present you as a, as a pure virgin to Christ. Meaning, man, I, I want you guys to remain faithful in your relationship to Christ. But he says, I, I have fear. He says, I have a, a deep fear that in the same way that the serpent deceived Eve, that he's gonna come in and deceive some of you guys and lead you astray. And that caused Paul anxiety. And, and fear and distress that, man, some of these people might be deceived and walk away from Christ. And that was a burden on his heart because he invested in these people. He loved these people. He cared for them. He wanted to see them flourishing in their walk with Jesus. And so the thought that Satan would come and deceive some of them and that they would walk away from Christ caused a, a, a healthy concern of anxiety, a healthy amount of anxiety in Paul's life. First Thessalonians chapter three, he writes to the church of Thessalonica 
Micah, which he also planted. And he says this in verse five. He says, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Paul says, man, I, I planted you guys. Your, your faith was flourishing. It was growing, but... I, I, I sent my brother and the Lord to come and to check on you. Why? He says, for fear that the tempter was somehow tempting you guys. And again, that his labor of love would be in vain. Paul, again, had a fear, a healthy concern and anxiety for the church at Thessalonica. He wasn't there anymore, but his heart was for them. This is what Paul's talking about again when he says in verse 28 of 2 Corinthians, he goes, again, I have this anxiety for all the churches. It was a deep concern, a deep care, a deep love for them. He writes to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. He says, my little children, for whom I am in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul describes himself as having emotional labor pains until Christ is fully birthed in this new premature church in their walk with Jesus. He says, man, I, I'm in anguish. It, like a mother giving birth to a child. He says, I, I want so badly that Christ would be formed in you. And until he is, until you guys are abounding and abiding in your walk with Christ, he goes, I, I, I'm in distress. I, I'm worried. I'm fearful. I have this certain type of anxiety. So Paul knew with all the churches that he planted over and over again in the New Testament, Paul knew the dangers of wolves coming in in sheep clothing. He knew that the enemy Satan would want to tempt and would want to deceive people and pull them away from their walk with Jesus. And so he is rightly concerned over these young churches who are young in the faith, who have just recently received Christ. And Paul says, man, I have this deep anxiety for all the churches because he loved them and because he cared for them and he wanted them to abound in their walk with Jesus. And so when Paul says this in verse 28, of 2 Corinthians 11, when he says, apart from all these things, all the burdens of ministry, he says, the pressure on me and my anxiety for all the churches. When he says that, he's not confessing his sin. He's not like, I have this anxiety. He's, it's not a confession of sin. What it is, he is communicating and revealing to the churches how much he values them. He is communicating to them how much he loves them, how much he desires God's kingdom to advance in these cities through these churches that he planted and the lives of these individuals who he discipled. The, the, this is Paul's heart. He had a genuine, deep care and a deep love for his brothers and sisters in Christ. He was anxious for them that they would continue to grow in their walk with Jesus. So again, what we see here in the scriptures is that not all anxiety is negative. There are negative uses when it it comes to spiritual aspects of our relationship with Christ and not trusting his providential care and worrying about the future, Jesus says, you don't need to do that because I have a plan for you. I have that taken care of. But Paul says, man, I do have an anxiety for people who Christ loves and who I want to see continue to grow and flourish in their walks with Christ and anxiety for the church is a burden that they would continue to flourish because he loved them and he cared for them. So what we see is that, again, these are the two main anxieties that scripture does speak to. A negative type of anxiety that is a result of not trusting God's providential care in our life, but also a positive anxiety, a healthy care and a healthy concern for people that they would grow and flourish in their walk with Jesus. But the question today that I wanna close with for all of us as we've taken some time here to look at both what scripture says, but also the certain types of anxiety that scripture does not speak to. Uh, what I want us to reflect on is simply this. As humans, we're all gonna experience different levels and amounts of different types of anxiety at different seasons of our life. And the question for you is, I don't know what you came in here and what your current situation is and what you're currently dealing with and what you're currently going through, but my guess is that being a human, there is some level of some type of anxiety anxiety in your life. And what I would simply want you to search for and to ask yourself is what is the root of whatever your anxiety is? What is the root of the anxiety that right now you're dealing with? And it could be multiple things, or it could just be one. Again, we talked about five. Is your anxiety that you're dealing with right now, is it just a normal temporary response to something that's happened in your life? It's just like you, you, might, you might have, again, stress over a test that's coming up. 
You, you might encounter a mountain lion on your front porch. You, you might be nervous for the Niners going to the football. Is your anxiety, is the root of it just, it's a normal temporary thing that's just an, a normal day-to-day thing and, and it will surely pass. Is it number two? For some, it could be, again, a physiological or a physical mental illness that maybe stems from a medical condition or that maybe stems from abuse or that stems from a traumatic experience in your past that you have not dealt with yet. If that is the root, again, it's important for us to identify the root of our anxiety anxiety because then we know how to deal with it. Then, then we know what channels to move forward in so that we can bring about healing. If, if, if that's you, if you're here, and again, it's, it's a form of mental illness, I would say, yeah, continue to take it to the Lord, continue to pray, continue to seek spiritual advice, but you know, maybe you do need to take further steps as well. Maybe you should start going to a psychologist. Maybe you should start getting some counseling and, and starting to uncover the deep things in your past that have been buried. And, 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 and there's certain people who have been skilled and trained and equipped in that who can help you walk through that to bring some healing, and which is a beautiful thing. Maybe, you're, uh, maybe your anxiety is rooted in, again, some, some sin that you haven't dealt with. Maybe it is some sin that you've continually been living in. You've continued being hiding. You're hiding it from other people. You're hiding it from your spouse. You're trying to hide it from God. And you have this continual anxiety because you know that what your lifestyle is is contrary to what God has for you. And so you constantly live in fear. You live in fear of other people. You live in fear of God. You live in all this fear. And God would say, I, I don't want that for you. God would say, man, you, you can come. And again, even in that, you can be made right. Seek reconciliation with God. Seek reconciliation with those who you've wronged. Maybe the result of your anxiety is some sin that you haven't dealt with. Maybe it is, again, number four, spiritual. Maybe you are obsessively worrying about the future, which is what the scripture speaks about when it says, don't be anxious. Maybe you're so obsessively worrying about your finances, about provision. Maybe it's certain things that are completely out of your control, your future, things that you had planned and they're not working, and you have all this anxiety anxiety. And you're like, how is this going to work out? God, I thought I was going to be here. I thought I was going to be making this much. I thought that I would be married at this time. I thought whatever. And you have all this anxiety and stress about things that are completely out of your control. And with those things, God would say, you know what? Again, the context relationship is that God's a father. He doesn't condemn you for those things. He invites you. He says, man, all those things you're worried about, all those things you're freaking out about, all those things you're stressed about, you can come and cast those burdens on me. He says, because I care for you. He says, you don't have to be anxious about those things, but through prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to me. Give those to me, and God will flood your heart with peace in the midst of anxiety. Or, again, number five, maybe it is the concern for the spiritual well-being of others, which is a positive anxiety that Paul had. Maybe there's people in your life who were once walking with Christ and now aren't, or maybe there's just people you've been praying for forever who have not yet met Christ, and you have a healthy, positive anxiety, not that it's debilitating or crippling, but a positive anxiety, a care, a concern for them. And you're just like, man, I want them to know Jesus. I want Christ to be formed in their heart. I want to see them growing and flourishing in their walk with Christ. And if, and if that's it, man, continue to lift those people up. Continue to reach out to those people. Continue to invest in those people. But again, identifying the root of where does your anxiety come from? Which category does it fit into? Identifying that is so helpful for you as an individual to begin to take the steps forward that you need to walk through that anxiety and process it in a healthy way. And here's the amazing thing. No matter what it is, no matter what the root of your anxiety is, whether it's just normal and temporary, whether it is a, a form of mental illness, whether it is the result of some sin you haven't dealt with, whether it is just stress and obsessive worry about the future, whether it is a deep care and concern and love for other people, whatever anxiety you are dealing with, the beautiful thing is this, you can bring it to Jesus. You can give it to him because he cares for you and he wants to carry that burden. And he already showed us that and proved us that when he carried our great greatest burden by going to the cross. He already said, I want to deal with it. Everything that you're carrying, I don't want you to carry that alone. And the fact that he, God, came to this earth and he, Jesus, went to the cross on our behalf to carry our greatest burden, to carry our sin, to take that upon himself, to give us new life, to give us freedom, to give us access to the Father. Because he's done that, he's saying, man, if I've given you my son, if I've freely given you him, how much more will he now give us all things? 
That's what Jesus says. He wants, to, he wants us to carry all of our anxiety and all of our burdens to him because he cares for us. So whatever camp you're in here, whatever you're wrestling with, whatever you're struggling with, I want you to know that Jesus knows what you're dealing with. He knows what the root of it is and he wants to help you carry that burden. You're not alone in the midst of that. There is hope, there is help. It hopefully is, uh, hopefully identifying the root helps you uh, access the proper channels you need, but Jesus wants to walk with you through that process. And if, and if there's anything that we can do as a church as well to come alongside you and help support you, if we can help point you in the right direction of good counselors or therapists, or if we can disciple you, uh, whatever it is, um, please let us know. We would love to help you as well. That's our heart and our mission, our goal. We wanna see you guys continue to flourish and grow in your relationship with Jesus. Amen.